known as the man who can't die. Meet the person who cheated death not once, but nine times. Brigadier Avin Chopra has stared death in its face and defied it time and time and time again, nine times. From surviving a helicopter crash in Kargil to being a target of militant ambush, Brigadier Chopra has overcome some very uncommon challenges. Join us as we dive deep into the remarkable journey of a man who has challenged all adversities and is a living testament of the never-say-die spirit of the Indian Armed Forces. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you, Raghu. So, sir, your journey of facing uh, death begins from the age of 22. Yeah. when you were one of the first soldiers of the Indian Armed Forces to enter Dhaka. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about your journey after being commissioned into your uh, regiment, into your battalion, uh, your first operation, which was the 1971 Ops That's right. into Dhaka. Yeah, I was uh, just about 22 years old when the Indo-Pak War 71 started. And... Uh, my unit was moved to the eastern sector um, and we were on the eastern side of the eastern sector, that is uh, um, Agartala. And we were to begin our operations from there. Uh, that time, it was a monsoon season when we just started and we did not want to go in straight. And also we lacked certain preparations in terms of intelligence and training our people who were to guide us and help us, that is Mukti Bainis. So to train them, we needed time. And therefore, it was decided at the highest level that we would postpone the real operations by about six months and maybe target a date somewhere around December. And that is the time when I was actually undergoing a, a mountain warfare course and it was cancelled and we were called back. Having come back to Agartala, at that time, the whole Indian Army was in a flux because things were not decided and everybody was getting moved from one place to another place. And therefore, to find your own unit, it became a, such a big problem. I took about 15 days Just or to 13 days gun. to go come from Gulmarg to uh, Agartala. And not when you say Agartala, it's not Agartala town. It is a border place. And uh, every second, third day, the unit would move. Mm -hmm. So when you reached a place, they would tell you, well, they Abhi, left yesterday. Abhi Abhi yesterday. Mm, it just left. <laughs> so that was the kind of a situation. Anyway, we, we worked hard on the Mukti Bainis. They were very dedicated people, but very young. Some of them were 15, 16 years old. But they had a lot of josh in them. And uh, we made full use of that. We wanted, what we wanted from them was three things. One is a guide, second is translation, and third was information. While they could uh, act as Bengalis or locals and go inside and get the information, we could not have taken the risk, especially when the war had not broken out. Broken out. For us to cross the international border would, would be not correct. So we did all that. And uh, when the war started, uh, we were inside the um, uh, East Pakistan that time, uh, two days ahead of the war. And uh, the first thing that was required to be captured was a border town called Akhora. Akhora. Akhora is a well-fortified railway station, but made f further fortified by anti-tank ditches and uh, water which had been uh, 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 no, channelized mm -hmm. into those uh, ditches, uh, mines, wire, barbed wires, and automatic weapons with tanks, uh, you know, uh, hull down positions. With all that, it was a real hard nut to crack. But as everybody, uh, every enemy or every uh, country does, the outer uh, crust is always difficult to mm -hmm. uh, crack. Mm -hmm. However, we had learned during those six months of our trial that there's no point trying to hit a hard 
target. Head on. The best is to surround it, pound it, mm. and psychologically weaken the enemy to such an extent that his will to fight is reduced. Mm -hmm. And then capture him from an unexpected direction. And that is what we did. And uh, we were successful in doing that. And that is where I first got blooded uh, in war. It was very scary. When I saw the first death of my men, um, it uh, really shook me. But later on, you got hardened and uh, developed a heart of steel. Yet you had some gold in it somewhere hidden in that steel. And to cite an example of that would be that as we captured Akhoda, at the end of it, uh, there was a man who was still firing. A uh, Pakistani. Pakistani. Mm -hmm. So my men took him on. And uh, when a gunshot was uh, aimed at him, he got badly wounded in the knee. When he got wounded, he raised his hand because thereafter he, surrendered. he could yeah. not do anything. But our men were really very charged, having seen so much of death. So they wanted to kill him immediately, which I stopped them. Uh, true to uh, the uh, Indian uh, system of uh, uh, being very human and following the rules of Geneva Convention, we said, no, we will not. Uh, he's, he's actually raised his hands mm -hmm. and he's no more a harmful person. So let's uh, uh, not do that. He will ultimately become a prisoner. Okay. okay. When he got close to him, uh, he folded his hand and said, Ki, you know, spare my life. Mm. Uh, I have come from West Pakistan only five days back. And I am 18 years old. I don't know how he was, entered the army 18 years old with probably very limited training. And uh, I found that he was bleeding profusely. So, I did not want to harm him further. So I said, let's carry that man to the first aid post of our, and, but my men refused. They were said, angry. No, mm. they, they were very angry. Mm. So I said, look, uh, there's no point being angry. If you can't lift him, I will lift him. As an officer, I tried to lift him, but then Therefore, probably the men stepped my in. men mm. would not accept that and uh, immediately took on that man. But when they reached the first aid post, the doctor there refused to even give a morphine injection to him. He said, I have a limited quantity. That's for my men. I can't give it to him. So I said, but then if he continues like this, he'll die. He said, let him die. So that is a kind of a steel uh, heart that you develop during the war. But having said that, you still have a gold somewhere hidden in that heart. And as an as a Indian, so therefore, I tried to convince the doctor, but he would not. And I took out my own morphine injection and gave it to him. And he, I don't know what happened thereafter. But two years later, while I was going back from my leave, my train stopped somewhere in Bihar in one of the way side station. And uh, I, like a young boy, uh, still unmarried, still a second lieutenant, not yet become a captain also. I got down from the train, had a smoke, and was sauntering up and down. Then I suddenly found somebody running towards me. This is uh, the prisoner of war uh, uh, the, Another train mm -hmm. was standing on the other side, mm -hmm. and these are prisoners of war being repatriated. Repatriated to West Pakistan. Uh, so the Gurkhas who were uh, guarding, guarding the train, mm -hmm. uh, they ran after him. They would not shoot him, mm -hmm. but uh, they ran after him to caught him, catch him. So when they, I told them, look, don't worry, don't worry, let's see. So he came and touched my feet and said, Ki, in Thet Punjabi or Urdu, he said, Saab, aapki badalat, aaj so the same boy. Same boy. Same boy. Two same years boy. Later. Wow. How he recognized me, I don't know. <laughs> but he said, aapki badalat, aaj main apne vatan vapas ja raha hu. That touched my heart very, very deeply. And that is the way Indian Army is. Well, they are steel when it comes to acting like that, but has uh -huh. definitely a gold somewhere. And this was the operation in which your uh, platoon itself was almost decimated. In uh, that was the next one. next one. That was after this when we went to Asuganj. Mm -hmm. Asuganj is a border town, not a border town, a, a town which is uh, on the, the biggest river of uh, Bangladesh, that time East Pakistan, 
and that's called Meghna River. Mm -hmm. On that, there is only a single bridge, mm -hmm. a railway bridge. Mm -hmm. And the other side, there is a cantonment, which is called the Bhairo Bazaar. Now, Bhairo Bazaar has cantonment means, obviously, like any other cantonment, it has got no defense potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's basically administration, family staying, they were scared that once the army comes in, Indian Army, Indian army. they mm -hmm. would probably misbehave with all our mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. loot things. They probably thought we would behave the way they, they do, they behave, but exactly. we did not. Mm -hmm. We were not supposed to be doing that. Mm -hmm. We never done it. Mm -hmm. So when we reached that place, uh, the enemy panicked and they blew off the bridge. That bridge lone mm -hmm. communication bridge that between mm -hmm. this side and the other side was removed. Mm -hmm. Now the enemy, which was left on this side, had Could no not, option mm -hmm. but, but to, to fight, fight with off. their back towards the river. So they got together and was being led by a brigadier who had no weapon with him, mm -hmm. very bold man. Mm -hmm. He was, had a stick in his hand mm -hmm. and he was trying to motivate the people to counterattack us. Mm -hmm. While we were at a lower height than them because they were on an embankment leading to the bridge, mm -hmm. which was much higher much than higher. The, because mm -hmm. of the water uh, around in that place. So they could shoot and we had 45 casualties there. My, including my platoon got decimated totally. Mm. And uh, I asked my, uh, uh, rather, uh, my CEO that, uh, sir, this is the situation, what do I do? He said, don't panic. These things, such things happen in war. So I, I uh, d uh, definitely agreed to what he's saying. And uh, I continued. Uh, after some time, he said, I'm sending you reinforcement. He sent me reinforcement of the company. Major T.L. Sharma was the head of the thing. When he came, and uh, we were trying to take a shoot at the enemy. When the enemy suddenly, a tank came in and shot. The bullet went through his helmet, through the Come. head, and out from the helmet, other side. And his gray matter was totally out, and he died instantly in, in my lap. I carried that blood for the rest of my war, uh, up to the time I reached Dhaka. And thereafter, the CO thought probably a little more reinforcement required. He sent another one, Major Sisodia. He also suffered very badly because he got a bullet in his knee while I was trying to pull him out uh, from a ditch. And so you can imagine how far I was from uh, such a direct hit to, to me also. And uh, when this thing happened, I told my men, look, I'm under orders to stay, but I know the situation is very bad. You all withdraw from here. There were just about uh, 15, 20 of them were left. Uh, that is not only my platoon, but well, others next. also hmm. who would come for reinforcement. Because when you have one casualty, it means four people yeah, have absolutely. to go to carry him. Carry, correct. So you are uh, the... Strength uh, is whittling down. It is actually uh, becomes a liability. So uh, I was left with that. My, uh, this is what, again I say Indian Army. My batman. Uh, who is called these days Sahek. Uh, buddy nowadays. Huh? <laughs> buddy. <laughs> yeah, buddy. buddy. Now you can call it Buddy. Uh, buddy said, uh, hey, sahab, maru mat aapke saath. Aapke saath. So I said, okay, your choice. Because he knew mm -hmm. that now it's a short death. Mm -hmm. So my one my, uh, chap with an arsenal gun, those times we had an arsenal gun yes. which was carried on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. So he said, sahab, do round bache hai, mm -hmm. wo bhi maar ke jata hum. Mm -hmm. So he also stayed back. My radio operator, he said, Sir, I went away, so you communicate not communicate, so I will stay with you. So four of us stayed. The enemy commander, brigadier, he gathered all these people. There must be around more than 100 people. And he counterattacked me. He was just about 15 or 20 meters away from me when I got the orders, withdraw. Withdraw. At that time, I just simply told him, sir, too late. Mm. Where will I withdraw now? Uh, mm. 15 meters, meters is hardly a time. Uh, and when you are in an assault, you are at a good speed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so another two minutes, they would be here. Mm. So I, mean, I didn't say it, but I thought <laughs> to myself. So therefore, uh, I, the only option was there was a manhole cover, lifted that, jumped, jumped into it. But I tell you, inside, it is worse than death. This was Cobwebs, sewer. It was dark, shit, right up to our calves, 
and uh, the smell was just couldn't breathe inside. We knew that we'll die here and nobody will know us, nobody will not even find our bodies. Anyway, fortunately, when we were traveling in that, just another, I think, 100, 150 meters, there was a big nala yeah. mm. on which this uh, thing, thing was, was empty. getting the sugar uh, was empty. Uh, mm. uh, thrown into that nala. We came out, washed ourselves and escaped. Another incident that happened there was while our tanks could not reach us uh, to help us in this uh, kind of a, um, a situation, uh, the Pakistanis, after having attacked me and I having pushed back and the rest of the people also having uh, tactically withdrawn, really, uh, to fight back, and uh, reorganize mm -hmm. and fight mm -hmm. back, uh, they came chasing us right up to the ditch which I was talking about. And uh, they fired on our tanks. One of our tanks, Kapola, flew. Just the tank, Kapola, flew with an arsial gun, mm -hmm. a 105, uh, 106 mm -hmm. rifle uh, mm -hmm. gun. And I could see, like a movie, that Kapola flying. And inside, there was a uh, second lieutenant, Lieutenant Mohan. He got burnt. He, the body was burnt. I was close to that place. I pulled him out. He survived till about two years back and uh, did not know that who saved him till by chance uh, I met another officer of his unit who told him that he is the one who saved you that day. So the, such are the situations which you encounter and really get blooded in war which can't be forgotten. Yeah. And these are the ones which instill in you a spirit of fighting back. I still remember that iconic photo of yours when you're walking into Dhaka, marching into Dhaka and your blood all over your, uh, your company commander's That's blood right. yes. in, uh, on That's your, which right. was several days later. Yes, several days later. Several days 14 later. days later. 14 days later and, and you, uh, you still did not get a chance to even wash your... Uh, no, no chance. And um, uh, when you were... Uh, the Indian troops marched into Dhaka from all sides. Because by then their will to fight, fight had been broken mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. And therefore, whether it was north or east or west, everywhere the troops started coming in. While we were going from the eastern side and having crossed, uh, started from Agartala to the uh, Akhara, captured Akhara, captured Asugan, and then went straight for uh, Dhaka. And when we entered Dhaka, uh, the crowd really uh, hugged us. Uh, the liberators, you came... Celebrated. Mm. They, they were liberated. Mm. They, they did not know what had hit them. Mm. They never thought it was possible. That so fast was, was our the movement, movement of the Indian that uh, mm. they were really surprised mm. and so happy that they hardly seen... Well, it. so were 90,000 Pakistanis. Yep. They were shocked also at right. the speed of the movement. That's right. So I, I know, sir, your, your life <laughs> is... We could, we could conduct a five-hour show on this, so we'll have to, you know, cut down. I now bring you to Siachen. So, uh, many of our viewers now know Siachen very well, but um, what many viewers may not know is that the Indian Army <laughs> is the entity which literally drew the map, whether it was Siachen, many other territories of India. And uh, here is the man who was uh, part of the first patrol which yeah. actually went to Siachen, planted the flag over there and said, this territory is ours. That's and I right. often say this, that you, even in the age of intercontinental ballistic missiles and uh, what have you, in the end it is that infantryman who puts the flag yeah. and says, Ye ilaka mira hai. Yeah. So I want you to tell us that story where you went to Siachen with the legendary uh, Bull Kumar. Yeah. Uh, I was an uh, instructor in high altitude warfare school when uh, Brigadier, uh, Colonel Bull Kumar, who was a commandant, uh, asked for volunteers to accompany him on a classified mission. Uh, he didn't tell us the details, mm -hmm. but uh, as I uh, always volunteered to do things which are extraordinary, I just took that chance and I said, yes, sir, I would like to go. And uh, then he disclosed to me the entire thing. He says, would you like to be my deputy? Mm -hmm. And I was a deputy uh, of that expedition. It was a top secret mission because uh, even a little inkling of our movement mm -hmm. in that area mm -hmm. would have... You know, Take it off created the, a mm. reaction from the Pakistani, Pakistani. side. Mm. So, therefore, we were left with nothing 
uh, as preparation mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to launch this mm -hmm. we had no equipment we had no training we had no maps we had no intelligence uh, and we were uh, rushed into that place uh, mrs gandhi was also very keen on this i have my photograph with her in her residence where she ultimately got killed when we went in we were supported by the para commandos to protect us our halted warfare school instructors mm -hmm. were good at mountaineering climbing and mm -hmm. mountaineering and skiing and also a platoon worth of uh, ladakh scouts mm -hmm. who were hardy people who could carry the loads because we had no other option mm -hmm. but to carry it on Man our pack. shoulders mm -hmm. and we could not have carried because we were to perform mm -hmm. the commanders were supposed to be carrying their ammunition and mm -hmm. weapons mm -hmm. so they are the people who were and we could not hire civilians of course so therefore uh, when we went in uh, it was a very tough job because we ha had no information we had no equipment uh, you can imagine that the equipment that we went in was uh, equipment which was left over by an american everest expedition, expedition which had um, been uh, sort of called off because of some Bad reason weather. of weather mm -hmm. or uh, in fighting mm -hmm. or something and uh, when we got to know i had a friend who helped me get that equipment i was given a blanket sanction to import that without getting checked in route Customs. anywhere mm -hmm. brought it we distributed it was the sizes were very big for us our chaps uh, most of our instructors were gurkhas and uh, kumonis who had small feet size 5 5 6 the shoes that i got was 7 8 9 so anyway we put three or four socks, socks together yeah. and mm. uh, went in the that time today it's i would say compared to that time it's 100 times better no, no of course i mean our viewers won't know but the first contingents that went into siachen yes. they had no specialized equipment yes. it was basically the winter clothing that we used in other parts of india yes absolutely but no idea about what is ultra high altitude and uh, uh, hapo hako all of those no. ailments uh, and we had a lot of casualties you know siachen is uh, actually not only weather and not only the equipment problem the problem is that the terrain itself terrain. Uh, apart from being high altitude, there are a number of crevices, crevices. Yes. and these are covered by snow, and you can't make out whether it mm. is a soft snow or it is going to lead you into the, the crevice. crevice. And once you go into crevice, there is, I think, I've not heard of anybody having ever gone come out of this mm. crevice. Mm. Very rare. Uh, I mean, we just rare. had an incident which happened uh, in. Uh, you know in in the civilian setup where yes. a man was rescued from the crevice and we yeah. know what yeah. it takes to yeah. you know how uh, rare it is oh it's yeah. uh, getting a child out of a bore well is so difficult yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. here the everything uh, when they have 40. all the equipment time everything mm. we had nothing mm. and there you cannot survive once you go yeah. inside the survival is just about 5 or 7 minutes that's right so that man had uh, accidentally fallen. fallen into it uh, our men who were accompanying him Uh, had not taken certain precautions because of some reason and uh, he was alone and uh, he was just he moaned for some time and then he kept quiet because probably he became unconscious but somebody had to go in to, to pull him out uh, yeah, put that out. latch mm -hmm. on him so that he could be pulled out mm -hmm. uh, nobody was volunteering to do that because you really is a land of unknown land mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't know how deep he is you don't know what uh, kind of a uh, you know uh surface is there what temperature is there is dark it is uh, ice cold minus 60 degrees and etc so i volunteered to go in because as an officer as a leader you have to so i went in i hooked on to him he was pulled out by the time he came out he was nearly dead but the, my men revived him and he was saved but they forgot me <laughs> they forgot you inside the crevice <laughs> they they totally in that uh, exuberance in that turmoil, yes, I exuberance know. of uh, mm -hmm. getting him mm -hmm. back to life mm -hmm. uh, they forgot me mm -hmm. uh, accidentally mm -hmm. so somebody just mm -hmm. realized so saab saab to he said are saab to andar hi they immediately because i was still roped up so uh -huh. they could easily pull me out but by the time i came i'm telling you i none of my body parts could be moved if you try to move then they would have broken broken up mm -hmm. they would have just broken like ice ice icicle anyway i survived with a high altitude pulmonary edema i was taken next day to lay put in a pressure chamber and i survived uh, again it's something that i don't know how 
I did survive. Uh, it was doctors had said it's impossible that he'll survive because my condition was so bad. Well, in addition to Siachen as one of your you know um, accomplishments, uh, it's also I mean I'm aware of it, but you should tell the viewers about the legendary assault method that was uh, named after you, sir, post Kargil. Yeah, it, uh, we've all heard of uh, Op Vijay, Op -Vijay and the Kargil, Kargil operation. And uh, we did uh, succeed in achieving <coughs> our aim as an army. But at what cost? We had to pay a tremendous cost in terms of human lives. Yes. So that Nearly is the time when, when it was thought of by the army that let's find a better method of doing the same thing instead of going over a similar situation and a similar method methodology and achieving a similar kind of a casualty mm -hmm. uh, may not be very prudent. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, they said, okay, let's ask for somebody who has been into high altitude for a long time. So since I had a uh, number of postings in every rank there, so they chose me and they posted me as a commandant. I was commanding an armored brigade. They took me off from there and put me there. This is the High Altitude Warfare High Altitude School. Warfare School. Mm -hmm. And, and just to tell the viewers, there are a few schools in the Indian Army which are considered to be some of the toughest uh, training. Of course, the Commando School in Belgaum is one of them, the Counterinsurgency Jungle Warfare School in Varangte, and of course, the High Altitude yeah. Warfare School. These are supposed to be legendary courses. Yes. Anybody who does this course and, uh, as in your case, gets an instructor grading and gets posted there as instructor yeah. is amongst the elite of the elitist. Yes, so it is. Please go ahead. So, so you commanded that school. Uh, I, I went there and then I got onto the job of finding a method. And uh, I said, my uh, asset as an instructor is the knowledge or training in climbing mountains. Mm -hmm. And in mountains, uh, the defender has a big problem which side to defend because there's, he's always short of troops, troops. and uh, therefore he has to prioritize. The moment he prioritizes, he has to leave out those which are most unlikely, unlikely. approaches. Mm -hmm. And that is the approach that I must take. That's what I, mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for that, you need special training, special equipment, and uh, special uh, support uh, in terms of uh, you know making them believe that we are not coming mm -hmm. from that side. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the attack is still going on on the other the side. Mm -hmm while his attention is drawn to that, you quietly move up and, out and uh, surprise him so badly that in, we don't suffer a single casualty while he suffers a complete uh, loss of uh, life and uh, the post. post. Hmm. And uh, this was ultimately named as the cliff chop assault. And uh, even till today, it is being practiced in spite of... So the cliff and the chop is from Chopra, your name. Yeah, that's <laughs> what uh, everybody is uh, saying. And that's what uh, our uh, army commanders, they thought that we should give the credit to him because it has come out. It was op validated also. That is actually, actually tried against live enemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, five of our people were able to kill... Six, uh, 13 or 14 people without suffering a single casualty. Totally surprised them. After the uh, yeah. incident. So that's, that's how uh, it, good it was. The same thing has been projected in a movie called Laksh. Laksh, yes. Yeah. So the last climb which yes, uh, yes. Hrithik Roshan does yes. uh, is uh, the climb that was the yeah. cliff chop assault. That, that in nutshell is the uh, concept. Then you also had a helicopter crash. Yeah. Tell us about that, sir. <laughs> uh, there was a little uh, discussion between the two uh, on the top uh, GOCs of that area, that's the Army Commander and uh, the Co Commander in Leh, where they found that uh, a particular post was important, but it could not be occupied during winters mm -hmm. because of lack of communication, lack of support in terms of casualty. Uh, uh, casualty evacuation or supply and uh, the winter there lasted for about seven, eight months. So it was very difficult to hold on to that place. Uh, but it was crucial. So they said, okay, okay let's not discuss uh, in the um, wilderness. Mm -hmm. Let's get uh, an expert to go and do it. So then I was chosen. I was that time Commandant Hawes and I was chosen to personally go and see, check the place. whether it is possible. Mm -hmm from all other angles uh, to occu firstly occupy and then survive in that place through the winters. Mm -hmm. So I was given a helicopter to do that. Unfortunately, when we were flying above uh, Kargil 
on the way to Leh. Uh, the helicopter developed a snag and uh, could not be controlled as far as flight path is concerned. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, it just came down crashing. And what would be the altitude, dive. sir, from where it was? Uh, about 30,000. Wow. Mm. Hmm. And it just came down crashing and the nose down. Uh, my and this is the, the cheetah? Uh, the, yeah, yeah, uh, correct. Uh, for, the, the <laughs> for those of the viewers who don't know, it's literally a bubble canopy of yeah. glass and some steel girders steel. and a motor. And yeah, it's one that, of the, that's what it it's a 1940s like. model, if I'm yes, not wrong. Yes, yes, very old one. <clears throat> And uh, my, the doors uh, flew off, hmm. they uh, got jet off, jettisoned yes. from there and they flew off. Uh, my briefcase flew off, my whatever headgear I was wearing flew off. And uh, the pilot uh, just turned left and said, okay, sir, gone. That is all the time that he had to tell me because uh, it was coming down with Crashing great down, yeah. speed. I lived my entire life in those two few seconds. And uh, so, as they say, you can see your life going I see, by. I saw my life and I saw my future life. Uh, when I say future, obviously of my children and my family. And uh, well, I could have done nothing about it. Uh, it just happened. Fortunately, the helicopter landed in a freshly mm. snowfall, fresh mm. snowfall, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was quite deep. Mm. So, it went into it. Okay. And that is how we uh, got saved. Though, of course, I suffered multiple uh, injuries. There's nothing intact in my body. Everything got broken. Five months I was in the hospital. And uh, my doctor said, Ki, well, you'll survive, but I cannot promise that you'll be able to walk. But I told him, sir, you do your best. I'll do my best. I'll walk out of the hospital. And I did. So you went through the rehab and you <laughs> walked, yes. yeah, back walked back out of the hospital. I told him, I'll not go in crutches. I will walk back. Though, of course, uh, when I went back to uh, command, I had to do upper school because I was So you there. went back to command? I went back to command. After five months? Yes. And uh, I was still in crutches. Mm. Uh, but uh, that was more for a precaution. But otherwise, I was walking. And after that, you have a IED blast in which oh. your jonga is oh, yes. tossed up into the air, rolls several yes. times, yes. a blast that kills civilians, yes. but you survive. Yes. It so happened that uh, mm, uh, in a certain area in Kashmir, where I was deployed with my, uh, my brigade, uh, I had inflicted very heavy uh, damage to the militants. And uh, the militants were after me uh, to eliminate me. Uh, they found me once. So this was a targeted... Uh, I was targeted, it happens. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put a old Fiat full of uh, TNT and rammed it into me. Uh, onto my gypsy. I was driving and uh, then they ambushed me. My vehicle got blasted uh, and went up along with me about 20 feet and rolled down into the cut. And when they ambushed me, uh, the bullets of course flew above me and we were saved. But I had total cut from here to the 32 stitches. Uh, everything was bleeding very badly. My white gray matter was out nearly. And uh, my left eye, this left eye cannot see uh, because it's totally damaged. And uh, JCO who was with me, so uh, he put me into another vehicle, which is a QRT, and he rushed. He dashed through all the barriers and he put me into Srinagar Hospital uh, in about 12 or 13 minutes. And that is how I survived. So, sir, Incident after incident after incident of actually, I mean, most uh, people in their lifetime, they would probably have faced maybe one, maybe maybe less than one instance of uh, looking at death right into the eyes. At the age of 76, and as you, <laughs> as you say, uh, so when Brigadier Chopra walks through uh, one of these um, metal detectors at the uh, airports, he sets them all off on uh, Christmas bells because he's got, as you said, he's more of a, Roboman <laughs> rather than <laughs> with all these. Now, you're settled in Pune. Yes. And you are um, uh, uh, working on a farm, yes. a strawberry farm, yes. and also educating uh, children, yes. uh, uh, taking care of children who can't uh, afford, whose parents can't afford to educate yes. them. What's your uh, take, sir, on life when people say that, oh, I'm going through very tough times? 
uh, this is a very challenging uh, uh, job I have got or I don't have work-life balance or I lost my uh, wealth in a stock market crash or I lost a loved one or you faced death nine times. Yeah, I did face it a number of times, sometimes voluntarily and sometimes uh, accidentally. Uh, every time, I, it's not that I was not scared. Uh, every time when you face a thing, uh, a situation, odd situation like that where life is at risk, you are a human being and your reactions are as good as any other man. But to rise up to that occasion is a split-second decision. You take that decision, either you're this side or that side. So either you can die or you can live. Living itself is a pride to yourself, which motivates you to further take risks in life. Uh, dying, I think, is a routine thing. Anybody, whether he dies in an accident on a roadside, whether he dies in a war, whether he dies because of a crash, it's, it's part of your life. Uh, when it will come, nobody knows. But to die every day, fearing that I may die, is no way of living. That's why I lived my life to the fullest. Every time I took the risk, sometimes I say, well, I volunteered to take that risk because I got motivated time and again that the day life has to end, it will end. Mm. I can do nothing about it. So might as well take the risk, enjoy that fruits of that success. To be a hero or to be a coward is a split second decision. Now, nobody is a hero or a coward for the for entire life or in every situation. That's an amazing lesson, sir. That, uh, as they say, there's this saying that uh, the day your death is written, that day it will come. And until that day comes, nothing can kill you. Nothing really can do. And until that day, we should live every day as a full day of life, regardless of what traumas, what challenges, what... Uh, what bad things uh, we That's are That's right, because, uh, you know, uh, it's not only that the army uh, only gives you such opportunities. Every situation gives you these uh, opportunities. Like you said, when I took that farm, it was a desolate place, uh, full of rocks, full of uh, snakes and scorpions, because that is all that I could afford. I couldn't afford proper Fertile agriculture land, land mm -hmm. uh, with my pension. So I took that. And I turned it into a strawberry farm after a lot of hard work. And a lot of times I got bitten by cobras. But then... The cobras died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the cobra died, but I definitely survived. <laughs> so that is how it happens. Because you get used to taking risks. And uh, every time it comes to you that if it happens, it happens. If it happens, it happens. Okay. So why should you be scared of it? Uh, scaring, to be scared is natural, but to overcome that, you have to motivate yourself to overcome it. And uh, sometimes you do and sometimes you fail. Those who fail, they fail. I, I did not fail. Uh, it's probably uh, my luck <laughs> and that God I'm sitting failed. here today uh, in spite of all this. <laughs> Sir, thanks a ton for coming here and sharing your life with us. And uh, I and I'm sure all of us who are watching you Wish you many, many, many more decades and many, many more brushes with death before <laughs> it finally comes. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.